Hey guys, welcome to D-Bike. My name is Dominic and in this series we're building an XC hardtail from scratch. Before we assemble the bike, however, we'll have a closer look at the different components, which I will share in different episodes. In today's episode, we're looking at the heart of the bike, which is the frame. My requirements for the frame was that it should be lightweight and cheap at the same time. So Chinese carbon frames were the obvious choice. However, the available information was quite rare or even absent for most of the products. And that's why I wanted to shed some light and provide you with some information regarding the ordering process, customer support, shipping time, uh, packaging quality, and also share some detailed inspection of the products to help you with your future purchase decisions. In this first episode, we are looking at the carbon hardtail frame from a Chinese manufacturer called Airwolf. I will talk you through the ordering process. Uh, then we will unbox the package together, uh, where I will share my first impressions. And afterwards, I will take the frame to our lab, where we will check the alignment of the bottom bracket and also of the steering tube with a stereoscopic image correlation system. And if you stay tuned until the end of the video, we will also CT scan the frame, which gives us in-depth information about the carbon layup quality and also if potential voids are present uh, within the carbon. So first of all, it is uh, quite important for me to tell you that I have no conflicts of interest. I bought all the parts with my own money. I did not get any compensation from any company whatsoever. Um, so this allows me to share my honest opinion about each product. So after a first quite disappointing experience with a Chinese company called Trifox, where they didn't even know when their own products uh, are available again, I canceled the order, got the refund and uh, had a look at this uh, carbon frame from Airwolf. So Airwolf is a Chinese carbon uh, manufacturer which is specialized in bicycle products. Um, I did not find any information about Airwolf beforehand, so no reviews, no tests, no videos. They don't even have their own website. And that's why I contact contacted the seller directly via AliExpress. And fortunately, they were super responsive. They answered all my questions super quickly, um, very detailed. Uh, so I was super happy with the customer support. They were also open for uh, custom orders. For example, I ordered some spare rear derailleur hangers. And I also advise you if you buy a frame independent of the brand, uh, just make sure that you have additional rear derailleur hangers because in case of a crash um, and it breaks, it's really hard to replace those. So the payment was carried out via PayPal. Super easy, super quick. And actually after uh, the payment was done, I received the package here uh, within less than seven days. So super quick shipping. shipping. Um, also the package looks quite solid. Uh, there is only one minor um, defect here on the box. Otherwise, uh, normal box. It's rattling inside a little bit, um, which means that the frame is probably not very well secured inside but I hope it's wrapped, wrapped quite well um, so that it doesn't got any damage from the shipping. Now, yeah, let's look at the box, unbox this package. So as I expected, the frame is tightly wrapped in this foamy sheet, so I don't think it should be damaged from the shipping. So there are the spare parts, I guess. Let's see what's inside. So 
So we, here we even got a headset. Um, so this is the whole headset, which got delivered with the frame. And then here we have the frame itself, also with the handlebars and seat post. Now let's unwrap uh, the frame and let's see how it looks like. So the frame already looks uh, quite nice, it's actually uh, super light. Oh well, uh, sorry for bothering, uh, my future editing me has to quickly interrupt here. Uh, I'm pretty sure you all guys want to know how light this frame really is, so we have to put it on the scale. Um, I removed everything from the frame, so all the screws of, for the bottle cages are gone. Um, there's no seat post clamp um, attached anymore and also the rear derailleur is gone. No headset installed, just a bare frame. So I brought my scale and zero it, and then let's put this frame on the scale. So the frame weighs exactly 966 grams. So uh, quite a nice weight for a mountain bike frame. Uh, yeah, let's look at the other components now so we have first the headset which came with the frame so just the headset and two washers I just weighed with the plastic so it's 134 grams for the headset and the washers and now let's look at the rear through axle the rear through axle weighs 44 grams and then we still have the seat post clamp it's quite a heavy aluminium one 
Z-Post clamp weighs just 30 grams. But I guess with a new one, we can go below 10 grams. Yeah. And then we have the rear derailleur hanger, which I dismounted. Um, and the rear derailleur hanger weighs just 19 grams. So pretty okay. And then what's only left are uh, the five screws uh, for the bottle cages, which are removed from the frame. And they weigh together 12 grams. So yeah, these were the weights of the frame and the different components. And now let's get back to it. Um, well, actually, I ordered a glossy one and this is more a matte finish. But nevertheless, um, it looks quite nice. Uh, I really like it. However, the paint job here at the bottom bracket, um, I don't know if you can see that, uh, is not very well made, but um, you won't see that anyhow. Uh, a good point is that there is already the internal cable routing um, pre-aligned. So there's already some cables, there are already cables inside which guide you for the internal cable routing, uh, which is very, very nice. Uh, also the paint shop here at the headset um, is not very well made. Um, maybe we will paint it the frame anyhow uh, another um, and also here the headset looks quite rough um, also on the inside uh, the sheets are not very well fitted together yeah so the inside doesn't look as stellar as the outside But otherwise, uh, the finish is very, very nice um, and super light. Now let's look at the seat post, which came with the frame. So also the seat post clamp was already um, attached to the frame. Here we have the additional rear derailleur hanger, which I ordered separately. So this is the seat post. Um, looks very nice from the outside. So it's a 30.8 uh, millimeter diameter. Uh, C post there's a small ridge where uh, they molded it together um, so also from the inside not quite as astonishing there's also quite some dirt still inside but otherwise uh, quite a nice product also the clamp looks a bit rough on the surface um, yeah let's see how this C post is performing all right some specs about this frame so this frame is called the airwolf m057 so m57 uh, it is a 29 inch wheel uh, hardtail with the boost standard in the back it comes with a threaded 73 millimeter bsa bottom bracket uh, just a normal bottom bracket for most of the mountain bikes nowadays. Um, so the frame is laid up with uh, T1100 Tori carbon fibers, so quite high modulus fibers. Um, it has a maximum tire clearance of 2.4 inches in the back and has a maximum uh, chain ring clearance of 36 teeth. Um, it is designed for 
full internal cable routing. So as you can see, the um, cables are already pre-installed um, as a guide to mount or to put in your own uh, cables, which is very neat uh, design. Um, it is one by specific, so there's um, no front derailleur mount uh, on this frame. Um, the C-tube diameter is 30.8 millimeters and the headset is a standard one, one, so one. It is a standard headset uh, tapered shape uh, with an integrated headset. Um, the steering tube is uh, 68 and a half degrees and the C-tube angle is 74 degrees, so quite standard for modern uh, cross-country bikes. Uh, not very on the aggressive side, but just, I would say, in the middle field. Um, it is a size L, so this frame size L, it uh, reaches uh, 40, uh, 455 millimeters and the stack is 622 millimeters. Included in the frame is the C-Post clamp. It is quite a heavy clamp out of aluminium. I probably replace it uh, in the future. Then there's also um, the rear through axle already mounted together with the rear derailleur hanger. Then, yeah, I ordered a separate rear derailleur hanger, um, an additional one. It doesn't come with a second one, so that's why I ordered it. Um, it comes with the headset um, already and also with the C tube. Um, so the most important components are delivered with the frame. Um, yeah, now let's look at the frame in the lab. Check the alignment of the bottom bracket and also of the uh, steering tube. And then put it in the CT scanner and check um, the quality of the carbon fiber layup. Um, check if there are potential voids. Hopefully there aren't, but maybe around <coughs> the bottom bracket. This is a, a prone uh, location where all the, the tubes come together, um, that there are um, voids inside. Um, yeah. All right, I'm now in our lab where we will look at the frame alignment using a digital image correlation system. On the left side, you'll see the setup and on the right is displayed what the camera system sees. I put some markers onto the frame, which are detected by the two cameras of the measuring system. The blue light is necessary to ensure a stable environment and high contrast. The tracked points define the frame as a rigid body and I will use a touch probe to create virtual points in both bottom bracket shells and in the head tube where the bearings will sit. These virtual points will then be used to define a cylinder in each bearing location. The alignment of the axis of the two paired cylinders will be compared in the end to determine how accurate the frame was manufactured. The cylinder of the drive side bearing shell is now visible on the right side. I will now add some more points to the drive side shell to increase the accuracy of the cylinder fit and afterwards I will continue with the non-drive side and finally measure the angle between the axis of the two cylinders. So why are we even looking at the frame alignment? Well, maybe you have already experienced a creaking bottom bracket. Usually with press fit bearings, if the bearing alignment is not on point, they will start creaking and wear out pretty quickly. However, with the BSA threaded bottom brackets, the play between the threads allows some compensation of the misalignment and that's why BSA bottom brackets hardly creak. However, <laughs> this does not change the fact that they are misaligned and they will wear out much faster than if they would have been perfectly aligned. At the moment, there is quite some debate on which bottom bracket standard is best especially now as a lot of manufacturers changed from press fit to threaded design again. Personally, I would have preferred a press fit bottom bracket on this frame as they are much stiffer than threaded bottom brackets. But maybe I'm just biased by Hambini's opinion. By the way, if you're interested in bearings, you have to check out his videos. I will link his channel in the video description down below. Threaded bottom brackets are quite easy to maintain as you can very rapidly replace them. But once you have a bearing press, well, press fit bearings don't really take longer to replace and the press fit technology is widely used in any industry. The angular alignment error of the two bottom bracket shells was measured to be roughly above 2 degrees. Well, it could be that I didn't accurately measure 
the shells as the threads didn't allow a precise placement of the touch probe tip. However, the deviation error of the point clouds, which defined the cylinders, was below a tenth of a millimeter. So if the misalignment is obvious either during the installation of the bottom bracket and the crankset or during riding, I will order for sure a Hambini BSA bottom bracket, which is currently out of stock, sadly. I repeated the same procedure for the headset bearing races and the angular misalignment was also here, over 2.5 degrees. I will now carefully observe the misalignment during the assembly of the headset because if the bearings do not sit flush with the frame, it can cause creaking and increased wear of the bearings or worst case, even a play of the fork in the headset. All right, so we scanned the frame now with a clinical CT scanner and this is the result from the scan. This is a volumetric representation of um, the acquired images. So basically it's a stack of gray value images and this represents now the density. Um, so the lighter or the brighter the color is, the denser the material is. And what we can clearly see in this image is that there are different parts which are reinforced or um, put together. So especially here um, on the chain stay and on the seat stays, we can see that different parts um, were glued together or pushed into each other. Then there is a reinforcement of the seat tube for the seat post, which is uh, a very nice thing. And then also a reinforcement um, of the head tube. So what I did now was I separated um, different parts of the frame, uh, which are interesting to um, have a look at it. Um, and reconstructed the images um, with a higher resolution so that we can uh, see um, more details. So we start first with the seat stay and then we go from part to part. So let's hide all the other parts. So here is now an image of the uh, seat stay. Um, and these are now the slides uh, from the CT scanner and we can basically also oh, we can basically um, move the slide from the front to the back and then in different planes as well um, but we stay now in the in the scanner plane so we can hide the volumetric representation and then we can have a closer look um, and what we don't want to see um, is voids or our voids um, within the carbon layup um, for example, here we, we don't see any void, um, so this is a good sign. So we can uh, scroll actually through the um, seat stay and we see here that something is going on. So it looks like the, the two, two, uh, two tubes were put or, uh, into each other um, and they're is some air within the layers so this is not a very uh, optimal scenario i would say um, and now uh, on the drive side we also see this uh, um, uh, two pieces put together and then laid up so we see a clear boundary in between um, hopefully this is stable um, so this would be very nice so very dense um, stable carbon layup um, but here we can see clearly that there is some air um, trapped into the carbon sheets. So this is not very stable. Um, let's hope it won't break at this uh, location. So we go further to the chain stay. Um, so the chain stay um, uh, of interest or the, the region of interest on chain stay will be here. A uh, similar pattern, uh, two tubes put uh, into each other. So let's hide this and let's look at the scan. So we hide the volumetric representation and we see exactly the same. So we can go back and forth. So what you can see here, the two dots uh, in, the, in, in the middle of the tubes, these are actually the plastic guides for the internal cable routing which are already uh, placed inside so you don't have to worry about these and we just look at the outside boundary and when we scroll through the images 
Uh, we also see here some trapped air um, within the carbon layup, um, visible from slide to slide. So this would be now a double tube, so a tube inside the tube, and then at some point uh, also some air uh, within, and at some point um, there will be only one layer present. So also here, not very optimal, but because we have two layers, one should be stiff enough or, or stable enough. So with two, it should be even more stable. Um, but the fusion of the two layers is definitely not optimal. Um, let's go now to the C-tube. Um, the C-tube, um, just for reference, um, we look now at this part of the frame um, where the uh, C-tube uh, is put inside. Um, so as we saw before, there is quite some reinforcement um, where the seat post uh, is put into the C-tube. Sorry. Um, so now let's look at the first view. So we scroll. Um, sorry. Scrolling from the front to the back. And let's zoom in a little bit. So this is where the tubes merge and also here we see some little voids um, from time to time. So this is now the back uh, which is coming in and what is interesting is um, where the tube meet each other. Um, so these regions are very important for a uh, stable frame. Uh, these look actually quite nicely. I don't see any major voids in this region. Uh, here I would say the carbon layup is also not very optimal. So here the tube shape is quite round. Here probably the air pressure wasn't optimal in this tube. So uh, what you can see here is um, a clear boundary, a clear layer. Uh, whereas here the, the layer is thicker, probably the same amount of material. That's why you have some air in between. Uh, that's why the, the layer is thicker. And also here is some voids everywhere. So not an optimal quality, I would say. But um, let's look at the head tube. So yeah, just for reference, this is the front of the bike. Um, now we look only at the head tube in the front. Uh, we can very nicely see the insertion of the, of the guiding wires here into the frame. So let's look now at the slices. So here are the two um, guiding cables for the rear shifting and the rear braking. Um, so if we scroll now through, um, let's go from the front to the back. So we start in the front and we can clearly see where the uh, bearings um, are fitted in. I'm not sure if this is a feature which is wanted uh, as it, it's on the left and on the right side. Um, it's probably wanted also at the bottom. Um, you see here the tips, it's not visible here. The important thing is that um, this region and this region here, where the bearings uh, are pushed in, that these are uh, nicely manufactured. Hopefully this is stable enough. Uh, by the looks of it, it should be. Here is the insertion of the, the wires. Um, that's why it looks a bit odd, but otherwise um, some small voids here in the layout, but not critical uh, for the stab stability of the frame. Um, otherwise here some minor things. And also uh, in this part, uh, further to the back, some air inside the layout. But apart from that, uh, very nicely done. So, yeah, nothing um, bad, I would say. So from here on, it looks very nicely. And now uh, the two tubes um, 
separate and it looks pretty nice. So only the tubes, very nicely done. Um, where they fuse, there is also no uh, major problem visible. And then some minor, probably not very structural uh, defects or, or voids within the frame. And now let's look at the bottom bracket. So just to demonstrate which is the front and the back. So um, here is to the right is the front and the back is to the left. So this is the shell for the PSA bottom bracket, um, which is glued into the carbon layup. That's why it's super bright. It's not because the layup or the carbon is so um, thick there or dense, that's because it's metal and metal um, has some artifacts which you can see in the slices. So when we put the slice right over the bottom bracket, um, the distortions um, are very clearly visible. So you see here everywhere uh, the distortions, also the black lines, this is because of the metal. Um, here, this is also a very nice view for the metal. But now let's focus on, on voids and potential flaws um, in the layup. So this is now the front. Let's go to the back. These are still the two cables. Now we can see um, some separation um, of the layup. Um, this is probably because of the glue for the bottom bracket. Um, yeah, here starts the metal part, which is glued into the carbon layup. This seems a bit odd to me. I don't know why there are some um, regions with lower density in the carbon, but it looks like it's systematic. So in all uh, four corners of the bottom bracket, there are these voids. So probably it's wanted. So uh, both at the bottom and at the top. So probably this is wanted. Um, Actually, I don't see um, any voids apart from, from these holes um, in the carbon layup, maybe here a little bit um, at the non-drive side, but not very critical uh, layup separations. And now we are at the back of the bike and looks fine again. Maybe if we uh, look from a different uh, perspective. So if you turn it, so this is not a side view um, of the bottom bracket. And this is just the shadow of the metal artifacts, so don't worry. So this is now the metal shell and probably the, the bright one here is the glue and then the carbon layer. And as before, I don't see any major holes in the carbon layup. This is now the hole from the, from the shell so that the cables for the internal cable routing can pass through. That's why there's only half a shell visible. And then the shell closes again as soon as the cables are through. Yeah, but bottom bracket looks super fine to me. Um, yeah, nothing to complain. Also from this view. Yeah, looks pretty solid to me. So there are some regions which are a bit questionable, um, in my opinion. Um, especially when you look at the head tube and also, oh, sorry. In the head tube, there are some voids, but also um, here in the seat stays and at the chain stays, um, some voids where the tubes meet, meet each other. Um, but the important part, uh, the bottom bracket looks super fine, so this should be um, stiff enough and then the rest we will see. 
Um, it's a very nice feature that they reinforced the, the seat post or the seat tube, I would say, um, because uh, this will be, especially in the hardtail, a quite um, heavily loaded part, um, because you can imagine there are no rear shock absorbing all the shocks um, coming through the bike, and especially if you're seated, then uh, all your body weight is, is loading as well onto the uh, seat tube. So um, it looks quite nice to me, some, I mean, Obviously, it's not <laughs> a perfect bike, but um, nothing major, I would say. Um, the only major or the only regions which are uh, not optimal, but they are double layered here, where the, the tubes are stick inch, or yeah, where they stick the, the tubes into into each other. Uh, so, yeah. The scan looks pretty nice, I'm very happy that I could uh, scan the frame and have now more confidence about um, the carbon layout. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you found this video interesting or helpful and if so then please like, subscribe and press the notification bell so that you get notified about my next video in this series. And finally I would be very interested to hear from your side, would you even consider buying a bike from an unknown Chinese carbon manufacturer or have you ever made a, an experience already um, a good one or bad one with Chinese carbon please let me know in the comments down below and if you have questions about the frame also don't hesitate to ask I will answer them if I can see you next time bye